Tesla is finally giving owners the update they've been waiting for. Plus, the Las Vegas loop may not be working as expected. And Fisker might be an expensive paperweight, but it may be coming back to life, sort of. All that and more starts right now. This podcast is brought to you by EVJet. More on that in a minute. And by the way, you can listen to this podcast across all major streaming platforms. Just search for Kim Java, even inside your Tesla. That should bring it right up. All right, let's dive right into it, talking about Fisker, because it is not just an expensive paperweight, as I said. (laughs) They're really still fighting for their life right now. Well, they are, and they're fighting for their customers. And it looks like, based on, of course, them recently filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in June, They've reached a new agreement with creditors to be able to possibly maintain service their existing fleet for their customers for at least an undisclosed amount of time. And now Fisker says, we're going to continue to give you the service for for at least right now. So the owner association will basically have a say to the intellectual property, and that includes the design as well as like the code that's needed to be able to do these updates to the car just to kind of get it get it to the level it was supposed to be at. Yes, these software updates, I doubt they're gonna be any sort of Easter eggs or fun little treats that you get for Christmas. So they're they're not gonna be any, it's gonna be a no frill sort of approach, I imagine. So it's just gonna make sure you're maintaining the ownership experience as you expected. Yeah, so it kind of like the way I'm thinking about it is like in the past, before we had all these tech cars, you bought a car and it was like, that was the year of the car and this is what it can do. And right now with Fisker, they're just going to make sure it's can do what it's supposed to do, yeah. but there's nothing new that's going to be coming. And I'm curious out there if you guys own a Fisker or maybe you have friends that you do. When you originally went to go buy this car, you're like, this is a tech car and it's going to improve over time the way Tesla and Rivian and Lucid and all these other tech cars seem to be doing it. And now it's sort of like, That's not going to be happening, but at least, you know, you'll be able to take care of some of the current issues that the owners are having. But how does that make you feel? Put that in the comments down below. Fisker, of course, is selling off its assets and paying creditors to be able to pull all this off. They've sold their IP and about $46 million in sales. They're also their existing inventory, some 3,200 oceans that were sold off to American Lease, a leasing company as well. So it's all out there. And then with American Lease, that they basically sell the cars for Uber and Lyft. That's right. They, they lease these cars to Uber and Lyft. So Uber and Lyft are going to possibly begin to see this in their fleet. So maybe one of the next rides you kind of hail is going to be into a Fisker Ocean as well. That'll be interesting to see yeah. for sure. And speaking of over-the-air updates, Fisker might not be able to give you improvements, but it looks like Tesla owners are going to be receiving 2024.32, which will have some some fun updates in it. <laughs> this is a big one. Yeah, this looks like it's already rolled out to employees. It's going to be available for S, X, 3, and Y, not the Cybertruck <laughs> quite yet. And it's going to be rolling out in the coming couple of weeks. But essentially what you're looking at is getting additional features within your UI here. And some big features are going to be embedded in there as well. So there's now going to be an icon that shows you if you have construction on your route and you can actually reroute in real time your navigation. I'm super excited for this. This kind of reminds me of Waze, right? The way it's kind of community driven, but this is going to pop up in your center screen within your navigation there with an icon that indicates that there is construction because a lot of times construction just kind of pops up that morning and you're not aware of it, but now you're gonna be able to see that in advance of your approaching it so you can detour, go around it as well. And Kim, this update also comes with predictive text. So as you're typing in a location that you wanna navigate to, it'll actually, right up next to it, give you areas of interest within proximity of your location to suggest possibly going to this place or that place. So that's gonna be available within this new update as well. So I can get my coffee wherever I'm at. (laughs) Exactly. So do you need premium connectivity though for all this to work? So surprisingly, you're not gonna need premium connectivity for this search of interest, area of interest uh, application. But when it comes to, yes, getting construction, premium connectivity is needed because that of course is happening up to the minute. But the areas of interest are gonna be uploaded into the actual navigation itself. So if you keep in mind, when we're road tripping in some you know, out of uh, service areas where we don't have access to, to find a destination, this area of interest now will pop up for you even if your car doesn't have cellular service or connectivity in a remote area. So you can you know, navigate to a Best Buy or whatever you know, from a location, as long as you type in Best Buy in the city. I do love that. And I love like getting these extra features added, um, especially when you're paying for something extra like premium connectivity. The one thing I still want with premium connectivity is actual connectivity 
to like all of your other devices. <laughs> So I'm still waiting for that one from Tesla. Hopefully that one will be like the next big update we get. Wi-Fi and tethering. And yeah, Starlink makes sense yes. to have something like that, right? When you have Starlink yes, access. Definitely. It came another feature added will be search this area within the navigation. So sort of, uh, sort of like Google Maps, when you're able to kind of zoom to a different spot on the map, search for whatever you're looking for in that same general area. This is going to be an option now within your Tesla center screen as well. So move it to a different spot, search this area, and it'll actually bring up the Starbucks you're looking for in that area of interest that you've pinched to. Because oftentimes, as it is right now, if you do that and pull it, it kind of zooms wide, shows you all the Starbucks across a large area. Now you can pinch to your area of interest and only search in that area. Another thing I'm excited about too, and I've talked a lot about tires and how that's something that when you own an EV is probably one of your biggest expenses out there is having to replace your tires more often. Well, now in the mobile app, you can get notifications to service your tires. So I think that's pretty cool. It's actually something you can set in terms of your mileage. So you can say, you know, at this amount of miles, I want to get a reminder to go ahead and service my tires. Yeah, it's set by the user and I think exactly rotating it, servicing it, replacing it. Once you've driven that number of miles after your tires have been put on, your app will tell you, hey, you've crossed 7,500 miles now, so time to rotate. So we're likely going to see a lot more features coming with this UI update. And one of them that we know is coming is Sirius XM coming to all of Tesla's lineup. And this is pretty cool because in the past, just the Model S and Model X had satellite and were able to get things like this. But now with premium connectivity, the other cars in Tesla's lineup are going to be able to get Sirius XM. Yeah, this is not the satellite receivers that you find on board in the Model S and X. Those are very pricey hardware embedded in those vehicles. This, as you said, needs premium connectivity and also gives you access to different content that you would get otherwise on the satellite-based version of Sirius XM. So there's live content, there's sports, there's other exclusive content that's on there. And this comes in addition to that. And what's fascinating about this is this was actually leaked on Sirius XM's Canadian website. They had all of this laid out saying this is coming to all of Tesla as soon as its own app on your center screen. They deleted this right away. But of course, this was uh, located and screen grabbed and shared. And now we can kind of see what to expect here with Sirius XM. So I think Tesla process. wasn't quite ready to like <laughs> release all this information. So they like quickly were like, hey, take it down, take it down. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty sure it is coming. I believe that this is going to be here soon. And I think it's exciting news, but it does make me wonder if the Model S and X are going to be getting rid of their satellites in the yeah. future. You know, they've always been all for trying to minimize hardware and make the products cheaper and more affordable by reducing any excess hardware. This exactly kind of hints at that for S and X possibly losing that satellite receiver hardware on board. And of course, the, the, as apparently what the post was trying to say is that there's a 30 day free trial, how you can access this free trial to get this app on your Tesla. So this again will be available, we think. Are you excited weeks. about this? This is something you've had in the past <laughs> on previous cars. I've never really like used it before. Yeah, way back in like 2005 or six, uh, I had Sirius XM or I guess it was just XM radio back then. Got the hardware installed onto my Mazda and was able to travel across the desert where I lived out in the Southwest. Did you and use it for access. sports or what uh, were you listening sports to? Sports was on there. I liked the comedy, the live comedy that was on there as well. But I mean, you just rarely lost connectivity when you drove in remote areas. I'm curious though, because I feel like the newer generation really just likes to listen to podcasts. Yeah. So I'm wondering like, if, I don't know. How do you guys feel about it? Let us know in the comments down below. Next up, we're seeing spottings of a Model X mule with something odd on top of it. <laughs> yeah, and if you know anything about Tesla's vision, it's vision-based. What this mule has is LiDAR approach and kind of the, uh, the outfittings of a LiDAR on board of it. Spotted in Northern California this week ahead of the RoboTaxi unveil event, which is on October 10th. And a lot of people are saying, hey, I thought Tesla was saying no radar, no ultrasonics. This is all vision. What's going on with having yes. LiDAR as well it, now? In the past, Elon even said that LiDAR is a fool's errand. Anyone relying on LiDAR is doomed. So why now are we seeing these Model Xs yeah. with LiDAR on top of them? And remember, over the years, we have seen Teslas spotted in the wild being tested with LiDAR on board. A Verge article earlier this year suggested Tesla was backtracking because FSD with vision base wasn't going to be working and Elon Musk quickly jumped on and said, no, it's actually not even a thing anymore. We're not going to be utilizing this. This was for validation purposes. So that was just a couple of months ago. Now, is this for validation purposes? Is this for RoboTaxi? 
Uh, what is Tesla thinking here when it comes to putting LiDAR back on its vehicles? I testing? really think that they are just double checking. And I think that they're using this as another way to show people, you know, how well the vision based approach works. And maybe they'll have some kind of demonstration during the RoboTaxi event well, showing side the light side. side by side. Okay. And that's what that's my guess. But what do you guys think? Why do you think that it has this LiDAR? I I I do not believe they're going to be adding that back into the vehicles. Yeah. And remember, we saw a Model 3, a refreshed Model 3 being tested in, I believe, California as well. A couple of months ago, we reported on it in this podcast uh, as well. It had all the sensors, all the camera housings on it. There was no LiDAR. That was ahead of the initial uh, robo-taxi event that was expected in August. So this, yes. this is back and LiDAR seems to be back this week. Yeah. And speaking of full self-driving and the robo-taxi event, there's been some talk because the Las Vegas Loop still doesn't have full self-driving in it yet. And a lot of people think, why doesn't this little <laughs> closed loop have it already? Yeah, we tried this a couple of years ago. You were there at CES and we made a video on this as well. And of course, we even asked them at that point, can this uh, have full self-driving or any sort of autopilot under the ground, they said, no, all driver assistant features are inactive underground. The top speed was 40 miles per hour. And of course, some of the naysayers are saying, hey, if FSD is working so well on the surface with all these complications, why can't they validate that, confirm that in a geofenced mapped sort of setting, the way, for example, Waymo does it, underground, under Las Vegas. And that's kind of one thing here that the officials in the last couple of days, the president for the convention center, it says the goal is by the end of this year, we'll have some driver assistant features available for those drivers. Because remember, the Boring Company was there to essentially make transportation cheaper, more efficient, mm -hmm. reduce and remove drivers eventually out of these vehicles and have this just loop automatically. It's really amazing advertising for Tesla because all these conventions like CES, SEMA that are at Las Vegas Convention Center get to take this Tesla loop to get there. So you would think that they would want to put full self-driving in this if they could. To feature it, yeah. And you know, again, the naysayers saying something like the weather, the restrictions on the roadways, the traffic hazards that are out there, things that make self-driving 100% reliable and available today, those are not present in a single lane environment where the car literally goes point A to point B to mm -hmm. point C every single time without any obstruction. The only thing I can think about is just where the passengers are getting in and out, making sure that they put on their seatbelts, all that kind of stuff. But then with Waymo, it's doing that. Yeah, it's still doing that and it's making it work. So in a city of however many million live in San Francisco yeah. and they're doing it on the streets. Yeah. where this is a closed loop. So I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are on this and why you think that that loop does not have a full robo-taxi FSD type situation going on yet. Maybe they need that LiDAR on, on the roof. <laughs> Next up, I've seen this go viral a couple times. People have actually been sending me this video and there's a woman supercharging her Tesla and she gets blocked in and kidnappers there's like four of them on her trying to pull her into their car and she has to fight them off and this whole thing was shot by another model x driver and i keep thinking why is that model <laughs> x driver recording hopefully they dialed 911 before all this went down yeah this was a scary situation it's really hard to watch and you kind of see this with four men they're armed they've got guns they kind of block her in so they're able to essentially pull her inside their car. They say, the officials say this was a targeted incident, but they pull her inside their car. They drive away. It was a, a, a blue Civic, I believe, that was stolen yeah. in Toronto. And they drive away a few blocks. She somehow gets out of the vehicle, Is actually uh, runs away. So I don't know what happened there. If they realized they got the wrong person, I don't know. But, uh, Why do they always say it's targeted? I don't know how much I believe that. I feel like they just say it's targeted so that people don't freak out. Maybe, yeah. But it's really scary. And this is kind of the situation we've t been talking about so much while we've been promoting EVject. But I guess in this situation, she was blocked in. Yeah. But it's still, it can happen while you're charging. It happens at gas stations. It happens, you know, unfortunately, more than we like to admit where you know, there's hijackings and things that happen while you're stopped, either refueling in whatever capacity you are. Yeah. And the EVject, the sponsor of this podcast also, you know, we touch on this because they provide this tool that a lot of people within the community absolutely love it because it essentially <laughs> acts as a circuit breaker, right? You plug it in. If you're in a supercharger where you're by yourself and you're maybe uncomfortable and don't want to have to get in and get out in case of an emergency, this allows you to just press unlock charge port on the vehicle, drive away, 
breaks this in half, protects the charger wand as it falls to the floor. You can actually send that wand back into EV Jacked and they'll replace that first one free of charge for you. And it works on level one, level two, level three supercharging, DC fast charging. They're working with OEMs as well, in addition to working with Tesla to get it to be compatible with V4 superchargers. So this yeah. is exactly why we And we have a code things. to give you 30% off. You can just use Kim Java, my name, and you will get 30% off. So that definitely helps you save right there. We'll link everything you need to know down in the description. But talking about some of these scary stories, there was another one sent to me here in Atlanta with a Cybertruck. And they were essentially able to peel the Cybertruck open like you'd peel open an orange. And it's kind of crazy to watch. Yeah, this was posted on a Facebook page for the Cybertruck owners group. And essentially what you're seeing is someone pulls up, they scout a cyber truck, it's late at night, they scout it, they get something out to where they kind of pop the top edge of the cyber truck window, which I thought you know was uh, more glass. resistant or armor glass of some uh, way, but this was able to shatter pretty easily. They pull the window down, reach in, open the door, get in, grab a backpack, and they're out of there. But the owner essentially said, why did I get no alarms, no warnings, nothing triggered to my mobile phone to tell me this was happening? He just shows up back to his car and realizes that his window has been shattered and his bag was stolen. And of course he has the video, which yeah. is what we're seeing here. Um, and it's just kind of crazy to watch this. And I really don't have answers for like, why didn't he get an alarm? Why didn't yeah. he get notified? Yeah, and of course the comment section is saying, you don't leave your backpack in plain sight, which is always... <laughs> Obviously, but that's not helpful at this point, right? <laughs> like those are those annoying comments. Yeah. Um, but it's also like, why are you not getting notified? Why are you not you know, getting this ahead of time. And I do think this tool obviously is used to break glass. It's not like something unique just to Tesla. But what I think is unique with the Cybertruck is that it is supposed to be armored glass. And I feel like it doesn't necessarily shatter like the way a typical car would. Instead, it kind of is like one little piece he just peels off. Yeah, I think a lot of the glass in vehicles is designed to be like that. I don't know how much uh, you know stronger the, the cyber glass uh, window should be compared to that. But I think in accidents, a lot of that glass is supposed to stay all in one piece yeah. so it doesn't hurt you. Well, what do you guys think about this? What do you make of it? Um, have you had any experiences like this with your Tesla? Let us know in the comments below. All right, up next, Tesla has introduced a new referral program. It's back again. It's a little bit different than ever before. And the discount is a lot the same because you're able to use someone's referral code. You get $1,000 off of an order of a Tesla, but the person who sends that referral out also gets $500 of credit. But there's a catch. <laughs> there's a catch. You can only use this 10 times. So yes. it kind of like opens up that playing field to everybody. Correct. Yep. 10 times. And then essentially what you're getting is credit to use within the Tesla shop, in the service center, if you have any service issues with your car as well, for merchandise. Basically, it's a credit card that you get. And yeah. <laughs> I like that it can be used for Tesla service. Yes. I will say that's something that I really like. And I do see why, why they're limiting this because in the past, you know, people like YouTubers or content creators out there put their code out there and then they get more of more of their referrals where this way, you opens know, the playing field up it really sure. opens it up. So yeah. like if you have friends, everybody can use it more and yeah. more. And you can also use your $500 earned per referral towards a new vehicle as well. So essentially $5,000 total with a with a 10 referrals. Yeah. You use $5,000. So Tesla's credit. minimizing their losses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I, I just like seeing the referral program back. I think it's pretty exciting. And, and speaking of, we'll definitely put ours in the description down below. So if you are in the market um, and you enjoy watching our videos, use our code. All right, moving on to something other than Tesla. How about this? Hyundai is moving on from its Ionic 7, which was the name of this new SUV, three-row SUV that was coming out to Ionic 9 and some yes. interesting reasoning behind why they're changing yes, the name. Yes, it sort of makes sense. So we know that Hyundai and Kia kind of share the same guts. Yeah. And we have reviewed the EV9. It is a great three-row vehicle, but they don't want people to think that the Ionic 7 was less than the 9, so they decided to make it also the 9. <laughs> so it's the Ionic 9. Yes. Yeah, three rows, starts at $50,000. Prior to now, we've just seen kind of the concept images, beautiful looking SUV coming out in 2025, 300 plus miles of range, 350 kilowatt charging. What they're saying now with this latest release here is you're able to see a camouflage version of it spotted by CarBuzz out in Colorado being tested and kind of get a good idea of what the headlights may look like. 
very vertical kind of LED layout there, wide athletic stance again. And it's supposed to be a pretty luxurious I'm excited to SUV. test this one out. I love testing out the three row SUVs. It's interesting to me that they call it like the luxurious SUV um, the, because like $50,000 starting price is a good starting price. But I feel like in this field, that's that's actually a pretty on the more affordable side yeah, for yeah. like a three row SUV. Yeah, I mean, we saw the the EV9, you know, says starting prices in the 60s, but you can probably end up with it in the 50s according to the dealer prices right now. So, I mean, but I don't know if I would call the EV9 luxury. Okay. Would you call it luxury? Premium. Premium, maybe. Okay, yeah. But I don't even know if I feel like the Model X is, is luxury. luxury yeah. I know, I know so, where you're going with it. I know what you mean. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? What do you think of when you think of luxury? Like, I feel like there's a little bit of a difference. Like, it has the tech. Yeah. But I don't know if tech and luxury are the same thing. People confuse tech for luxury oftentimes. But yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Moving on. And this is a story I thought was super interesting because you don't necessarily think about Tesla from a police standpoint. So we get really excited as Tesla owners when we see Teslas out there that have been retrofitted to be a police vehicle. But I don't know, like as a typical driver, I don't know what a police needs for their vehicle and how that will feel in action. And some of them don't seem to really love it. Yeah. So for the most part, people have actually, the police departments that have had this across the country and made that transition to introducing Model Ys in a lot of cases to their fleet have really come to enjoy it, including some Model 3s as well in the fleet. But, and of course there's cost savings, there's performance benefits as well. But the Menlo Park Police Department in California says we tried, we're proud that we tried. It just didn't work out for us. And it had to do with some of its smart tech features and just the interior space. Yeah, the space. They mentioned that the seat and the passenger seat just wasn't as comfortable for those long shifts. Yeah, 12-hour shifts when they're doing these training and having essentially a, another officer in the passenger seat for 12 hours uh, monitoring and trying to learn how everything goes. So they're basically saying with everything that's on board, and this, of course, has been highly modified from specialized seat belts to a gun rack to the bulletproof vest they have to wear, to the siren above, of course, and then additional hardware, the window guardrails, the divider between the passengers that are gonna be in the back to the people in the front, all of these things really minimize the amount of comfort and room there is with all the gear they have on board, where your vest is basically drooping over into the passenger seat and making it uncomfortable. Prior to this, they had a Ford Explorer hybrid, um, and they're saying essentially the cost of it to upgrade the Model Y to be a police vehicle was slightly more, and in addition to that, the Model Y itself was more expensive than the Explorer Hybrid. So about 33% more expensive. They weren't able to offset the cost. And on top of that, some of these smart features you're mentioning. Yeah, so what's interesting to me is I think the typical driver really loves these smart features, but from a police standpoint, they might not be as helpful. And some of those, they talked about autopilot interference, a delay when they shift from drive. Um, and this is something we've, we have noticed. It's not like a big deal when you go from autopilot into drive, maybe a slight delay, but when you are trying to, you know, catch another like a speeding <laughs> criminal maybe that's something that's really important those couple seconds yeah right i mean there. obviously you could turn off some of these driver assist features they talk about uh, this corrective steering where you're trying to get off the side of the highway and it dings and wants to bring you back on into your lane so these are all software based that can be corrected but there's additional ones they're talking about where i guess standard police practice when you're approaching someone is to dim your lights and it takes multiple steps to go into your center mm -hmm. screen to dim the lights on board and all of these little things that are convenient for you and I. The proximity uh, locking, yeah. they said that can be an issue for them as well. And for me, this feels like a really easy software fix. I feel like Tesla should maybe get a focus group out there with police officers and say, hey, what are some of these features that you need and have a special um, setting for law enforcement? Yeah, we could definitely have a special software go out only to those police vehicles, considering how much time, effort and money goes into retrofitting them in the first place. So yes, that's something. It seems that could like be done. an easy fix, and I'm hoping this is something that Tesla will start doing. And you know, articles like this, as much as you see them, and you're like, how could these people not love having a Tesla? You know, listen to them, read them, take them in, and then hopefully Tesla does the same thing, and they can just improve them. And that's like the big benefit of having these software-based cars. And that's why I feel bad for some of these Fisker owners too, because <laughs> yeah. they can't have these constant improvements um, that are easy to do with those software upgrades. But let me know what you guys think about this. Um, do you think it's interesting? I do want to see more police cars. I really want to see more of these Cybertruck 
police cars. I feel like I've been no. seeing lots of images of them over in Dubai, and I want to see more of them here in the U.S. That would be exciting, but I'm not sure how they can offset the cost with that one <laughs> yeah, might take least, a little bit longer yeah. to offset. All right, final story today. Let's talk about Cadillac. I found this to be really interesting because you know how most automakers have kind of moved away from going all EV for now and trying to do this hybrid transition. GM included, they're kind of doing a little bit of a hybrid transition saying that they want to give time for their customers to ease into electrification. Well, Cadillac, of course, yeah, subsidiary. Cadillac's of, part of GM, though. Part of GM. Uh, Cadillac says that actually they're going to be going in all in on electrics. They're not into this hybrid approach. They're going to have all in on their ICE vehicle, performance ICE vehicles, in addition to all in electrics. No in between point. And this is, we've seen this with the IQ, the, the Escalade IQ that's going to be coming out soon, the Optic that was recently announced, of course, the Lyric that a lot of people love. So Cadillac has introduced multiple EVs in recent months, and they're saying, you're not going to see a hybrid from us. We love to give you great high-performance gas cars and great high-performance electric I cars. I love it. <laughs> I think that they're doing the right thing here, but, you know, I guess we'll see. We'll see. The future we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, and with that, thank you guys so much for joining us on this podcast. And remember, you can get this podcast a day early if you go onto our Patreon and you sign up to be one of our patrons yes. on there. Members get exclusive access to content, never before seen footage, one-on-one -on -one Q and A's with Kim and I, and behind the scenes footage as well. So make sure you check that out, we'll link it below. All right, and we'll catch you next week.